Welcome to the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video table number 35. How to be aware of security problems on your network. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing a cameraman, sometimes I move around a lot. I am kind of hyper. Um, my name is Craig Rowland. Uh, I do run a, a website um, oops, called uh, Sinex Software. It's basically my own homepage. It's really not a company. Um, the website address is up there. That's my email address. If you need to contact me for any question, recipes, whatever, um, just write me there. I'll be happy to get back to you. I'm generally pretty responsive. Sometimes things fall through, like my filter somehow uh, throws you in the dev null, but that doesn't happen too often. Um, so give it a shot. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, basic ways to detect an intruder. From my experience, I've done a lot of system auditing um, work as well as intrusion detection system, and actively right now, I do work on a security auditing tool um, exploit development. The easiest way to detect an intruder is awareness. And you know, it's just there three times because you need to really be aware of what your computers are telling you. In almost every case, there's going to be an indication of what that person's doing on your network, and there's always going to be some way that you can detect it. And specifically, you need to be aware, and it matters so much because computers almost always tell you when there's a problem. As stealthy as you want to be, if someone's coming in and causing bizarre application errors, like for instance, you're running Bind 495, it's been working great. One, one morning, 2 a.m., it core dumps. You know, no reason whatsoever. It's never done that. You've had it up for over a year. What's the problem? We maybe need to look into it if we're trying to remote root overflow exploit. It's, it's certainly going to tell you what's going on. Um, system errors, too. When someone's banging on your system, it's very hard to be quiet. And even though a data may not specifically say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm being hacked, they may indicate other error messages that certainly show that there's going to be a problem. So, for instance, if you do a standard port scan against RSH, it's going to say illegal, uh, illegal connect or connect on an illegal port. And basically, what that means is someone connected to your RSH daemon from a high ephemeral port number. And yeah, it may not necessarily be a hack, but it certainly points to the fact that they're probably doing some type of port scan on you. Um, other things too, users may notice an application isn't working right, or they're corrupted or missing files, or somehow that some type of data that they thought they had entered is missing, or it's been corrupted, or it's returning incorrect values, and these are surely indicators that something's going on there. And a lot of problems you find on systems aren't caused by the computer system themselves. There's almost always some type of human behind it, and it may not be deliberate. It could just be a user fouling up somewhere, but a lot of times it can also indicate that there's an intruder hanging around there. The second point there is that every interaction with a computer system causes a change in its state. I don't care how subtle it is. If you log into a box, you are changing multiple um, items on that system that can be logged, audited, traced, and accounted on. This, this doesn't include just the basic stuff such as log files itself, but you have to process accounting records, log in accounting records. You have changes in maybe the swap file. Um, you have changes in how much CPU is being used. And all these things can be looked at and monitored, and you can detect whether or not a problem is actually happening before it's become a really big issue. And the last thing here, and this is the thing that as an attacker, um, this is what they focus on. Attackers really are counting on you not to notice their presence. This is why there's so much stealth and sneaking around involved when you're hacking a system itself. Even the time of day that a hacker attacks a box is typically um, related for two things. You know, one can be their, you know, the insomnia, which is always present. But um, the second thing, too, is you know, at 3 a.m., people really aren't watching the boxes too close. So really, they're, they're kind of on the fact that you're not going to be aware that they're there. So the basic thing, what I call a primary director of computer security, is that under no circumstances will you do ever allow an intruder on the target host system you control. This is for a variety of reasons. The basic one is that once an intruder gets on your box, you are quickly losing how many options you have left to, um, to prevent, prevent their spread throughout the entire network. In fact, I spent a lot of money this weekend contacting an animation and design house. And I made three special slides just for DEF CON. It's very important because we're going to illustrate the exact thing that's going to happen if intruder gets a single toehold on one of your systems. The first thing they're going to do, whoa, and I go all the way to the end, and that's really bad. I'm an act. Um, they're going to start there. you got the evil hacker. 
And the first thing he's going to do, he's going to start crawling through your network. And he's just going to start breaking machines. He's got sniffers loaded up. He's got Trojan horses fired. And he's going to have, um, he's going to have binaries replaced. He's going to be social engineering users and grabbing passwords. He's going to go through your network. And he's going to be pulling out no password accounts. He's going to be cracking the passwords once he pulls the passwords back to his system. And he's just going to go on and on and on. Once he takes control of your network, and this is going to happen once they get on a single host. We've seen it lots of times. Once they take control of your network, there's only one possible thing left for them to do. And Hollywood has shown us this time and time again. And that is, in fact, the hacking of the Whopper supercomputer. And at this point, they're going to take over the military industrial complex in the United States, which includes the jets, the helicopters, the tanks, the Viking slave ships. And they will eventually take over a fleet of hot air balloons. And they will take your tired, sleepless, ragged out sys admin and they're going to fly him up to the highest altitude they can attain and they're going to throw his pathetic security wooden ass over. Man. And as he's falling to the ground, he's going to realize something. That because he allowed that person under the one network, he has in fact led the total world domination of the hacker. As they spread from continent to continent, they're going to attack and attack and attack until finally the entire planet is overrun and there's nothing he can do about this. Now there are two basic reasons. There are two reasons. And that's, the end of my, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. There, there are... <laughs> Okay, now there are two reasons I'm showing you this. Number one is to prove that Microsoft provides way too much clip art for a person like me to effectively use in a presentation. <laughs> and point two is to illustrate the fact that once a person gets on your host, the amount of damage they can do by concealing their activities, spreading from host to host, and taking control of your network begins to approach infinity. And the amount of options you have left to control their spread through your network and clean up the situation rapidly approaches zero. So basically, I have what I call four tiers of network security. Um, the, the tier one, you can see over a file by the brick wall there on the right hand side. These are your classical security measures. These are going to be your filters, your firewalls, centralized dial-ins, and also good network design and administration. This is really, really important. Um, a bad network design from the beginning damages security so badly it's hard to put into words. Um, if you're going in for a network redesign, you need to make sure security is designed from the beginning. Um, these are effective because they, have, they prevent the attack from even beginning, and that's really the best way to, to keep something from happening. It's like, you know, you have a house with an alarm system. Sure, you have motion detectors, but it sure would be nice to have bars on the windows so they can't get in to begin with. Um, and this is really, this is really, you need to make sure this is a, a very strong part of your network security architecture, although there are certain changes in the internet that are kind of destroying the whole concept of a hard perimeter, and it's because new services are emerging that don't necessarily mesh well with this. But in any event, you should make sure that this is a key component of anything you do. Tier two are um, tools that promote network-wide awareness and protection. Um, Network-based IDS, internal packet filters. So you have something, you have a packet filter that splits up sales and R&D. There's no reason they should have absolute direct communication with each other. Um, centralized log file auditing. These are effective at detecting attacks, but maybe they can't necessarily do anything about it. Network IDS maybe could spot an attack and stop it, but a log file auditing is maybe going to tell you that there's something going on, but maybe that um, you need to look into it. it might not be able to take action directly of itself. Tier three, um, this is basically saying that someone's actively attacking your host. And this is really the last phase where someone can mount an effective defense. This is your network-based IDS again, um, host-based IDS, your log file auditing on a per-host basis, wrappers, filters, and other very uh, centralized uh, or distributed host-based security mechanisms that you may have deployed throughout your network. And again, this is the last available defense before your host is potentially compromised. Excuse me? Intrusion detection systems. Now, the fourth tier is what I call the coffee tier, because this is when you're going to be awake a lot. Um, pretty much your security has failed. And I'm not saying that checksums and the like are bad. I'm just saying that a checksum is telling you that someone has broken into your house and they changed something. And now you're at the point where you're going to really need to start looking at your backups and maybe start seeing if someone has gotten onto your network, how bad the incursion has been, and then try to start cleaning up the process. You really don't want to get to this point. Um, my tools that I've written are basically designed to work at like the, the, the tier level three or maybe tier level four a little bit. But basically, my core premise is to keep people off the host to begin with under all circumstances. I really don't want to handle if a person gets on. There's very little you can do. Um, I, I have a tool in mind that may help a little bit with the, the tier four side of things. But again, it's kind of a little too late by that point. 
Um, and here I am, I'm going to misapply Occam's razor, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Occam's razor and the art of computer security. Occam's razor is uh, a, I guess, a philosophy or technique used in the scientific method. And basically what it says is it's very simple. When faced with two hypotheses that explain data equally well, choose a simpler. And you can use this for a variety of things, but for computer security, it applies very nicely. So for instance, you have a system hacked. The first thing you need to think of is, is how is it done? And you should think, well, is it an elite exploit that isn't out on the web yet, or is it a common hole that perhaps I overlooked? And the answer almost always is, it's probably a common hole you overlooked. So you need to look into that first, and if you can't find an answer at that point, then you really need to move on and say, maybe this is something unknown, and then escalate from there. So the basis of my tools is to use generic, and simple uh, detection methods first and always. And the same thing should be done too when you're securing your network. You should really watch for and fix common problems first. When you're looking through your network, like let's say you, you just spent 10K, you buy a brand new security scanner, and you run it. Well, you want to look at the easy things first because those are going to be the ones that other people are going to find. So you have your exotic exploits, which maybe involve some type of very unique situation and sequence numbers or, or some type of exact buffer offset with a particular CPU type to have execute. Or you look at the fact that you're exporting everything via NFS. They have unpassworded accounts. Or you have transit of trust all over the place. Someone can just crawl through your network using an RSH. Um, you want to always fix the simpler things first. And likewise for the security tools, I'm kind of the same way that people are going to try the easier things first, and so that's really what I'm going to watch for, and then I'll escalate if I have to. Now, the tools basically are pretty simple. Um, LogCheck uh, has been around for about five years, just as LogFile Audit, and it's pretty basic. Um, in some ways, it's kind of getting a little... Um, a little behind because I haven't updated some of the keyword databases in a year or two. Um, port Sentry does port scan detection and Host Sentry does login anomaly detection and that's my most recent release of a tool. Um, log check itself just watches log files. Um, it's really simple. It's amazing how much information is gathered in your log files when someone's attacking you. And the thing is you need to be able to look at the log files and determine what is and isn't a problem. And if you don't know what is or isn't a problem, then at least you have the information around to show someone else who may be able to pull that information out. And log check basically is a clone of a TIS gauntlet script called uh, frequentcheck.sh. This is probably from the older version of gauntlet. Um, I saw it run a couple times. I liked how it operated. It was pretty nice. Um, log check has three basic phases. The first phase is it's going to um, report known hacking attempts. So it's actually going to look through when I have keyword files set out like someone's verified root or expanding to something or they're trying to pass on the UED code, etc., etc. And I know these are hacking attempts. I'm going to flag them like that. Um, the list isn't very long now because I really want to avoid false alarms there. Now, the second thing it looks for is reporting possible security problems. And this is done through a variety of mechanisms. Number one, I went through a whole bunch of daemons and I pulled out uh, error messages that they drop the syslog that are probably uh, security problems of some type. Um, the second thing it, I did was I thought about how an author writing a security tool would represent something that's bad, which basically means I pull out words that are in the negative, such as denied or illegal or prohibited, and I dropped all these words in the keyword list at all. The last part here is something I really liked from the original script from Gauntlet. Basically, anything it didn't recognize as something to ignore, it reports. So if there's something going on that I haven't seen before in the day, then you're going to hear about it because I haven't told it to ignore it. And this is really nice, especially um, you know, a couple weeks ago, I had a hard drive start footsing out on me. Well, I didn't know the driver was going to report a whole bunch of read errors, and I might not have seen those in the logs, but because it showed up as something not to ignore, it immediately came up and I could look into the problem itself. Now here's some uh, examples I have here. This is very basic. Um, active system attack will just come up as that. Um, I, I have a lot of custom daemons that report information to me. In one case here, uh, right after the, um, I guess it's name the overflow, I forgot which, but someone's doing a bind version request all over the place. Yeah, it just will come up and it'll just tell you that. It's pretty simple. Um, the second one too, um, security violations. This is keen on that word security alert. That's something Firewall Toolkit did. Um, I kind of like that. I make all my daemons do that as well. A big problem with Unix in general is that the auditing pretty much stinks. Um, if you get into the trusted versions of the OS, it's a lot better, but the problem with the uh, you know, uh, Linux and the BSD versions is that 
that there's no real standard for an author to write to if there's a security problem. So how do they represent a security problem in your law? So really they make something up and they throw it in there and they hope that someone sees it. Sometimes it's a good message, sometimes it's not. It's one advantage that, um, for instance, NT has because out of the box you have different um, sets of logging for security system or application errors and that really helps go into your log files. I'm hoping one day that becomes more widespread under Unix. Um, and here's actually a full thing here. We're here. Someone did a heavy scan. I don't have the full thing because they're going for pages. Um, they did a heavy scan against the host. I controlled. Um, here they tried expanding root. Generally not um, not a good thing. I found upon it. Um, they went down here. Unusual system events. Um, here they're hit, hitting the packet filter and they're having a fun time there trying to hit telnet, IMAP, and POP3. Oh, they did something else too that was interesting. Um, here you can see they're coming from the telnet port, going to the telnet port. That's called source porting. They try to source porting attack. They try to source porting from uh, FTP data port 20. And they also tried uh, regular scans using high ephemeral ports. What they're doing there is they're trying to hop my packet filter. If you've ever tried to des um, do packet filter rules, um, it's complicated. And especially if you have a lot of services going on. And sometimes admins get things a little confused on how to let ports through. So if you perform a port scan and you try to come from the same port as you're going to, if they screwed up the packet filter, the rule, you could sometimes punch through it because they set that they set the, uh, the connection up two ways. So if you're doing port scanning, you should probably try that. Um, if you're trying to protect against port scanning, you make sure you don't do that. Um, there are some dangers with log check. Um, one is log flooding. If you run an ancient version of syslog, you have port 514 open, that's a UDP port. A UDP port means that I can send whatever information I want and make it appear to come from anyone, including your own host. So if I just start random information into your log files, I can fill up the log files or I can make your reports come out um, very long. There's an additional danger too. I don't think log check has this problem, but there are other log file auditors that take action based on what's in that information. If I were to file something in to your log file and like some properly placed semicolons, for instance, and you pipe that out to something, like a pager script you hacked up, I can start running commands in your host. So you need to remember that log files are completely untrusted data source, and you don't ever want to trust that data in the log files, and you certainly don't want to pull that data out and do anything with it unattended unless you have thoroughly gone through and had something clean it up, because people can really insert some stuff in there. I, don't, I haven't heard of anyone doing this yet, but it certainly from the realm of possibilities. If you use a log check, don't modify it and make it run stuff uh, based on that because you may, you may get bitten really bad. Um, false alarms are another problem too. Sometimes um, um, you, with the way log check is, I can't accommodate every system. You're going to have to go through and tune it. There's uh, no other way to put it. All the log file auditing tools are the same way pretty much. Port Sentry, this is a tool I wrote in uh, October 97, I think after an evening, I got frustrated because someone kept port scanning a box I couldn't firewall, and it was an older OS that patches weren't readily available for, so I decided just to give them something the port scan. And the way I used to do this is um, I'd set up tripwire ports using TCP wrappers out of INET D. Um, but that's kind of, uh, that got me a little bit nervous because I wasn't using a tool specifically designed for that. So I just went ahead and I wrote something really fast that would bind to a bunch of ports. And when they hit it, it would just drop the route or it would um, drop them into a filter. Uh, basically, um, do you already know what a port scan is? I may have to say, well, I'll explain anyway because someone doesn't want to admit it. Um, basically, a port scan is a person is attempting to contact your host and see if you have a port open for a hole they can potentially exploit, such as IMAP or port map or mount D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they do this as a recon mechanism. So what you want to do is if you can detect this early enough, you can actually stop them from getting that reconnaissance information and get an alert at the same time that someone's doing this and maybe it's a host you need to watch. Now, there are lots of other tools out there that do this, but Port Sentry really has something kind of, I guess, controversial is the only way to say it. I, I, I do real-time blocking. So if you hit a port and it's trip-wired, you're going to immediately get dropped into a bad route or a packet filter or TCP wrappers, and your host is going to be actually denied access to the host itself. Now, here I have the benefit of surprise. If someone's scanning your host and all of a sudden it just dies, it really isn't a good feeling. And then what the, sometimes what you'll see them do is they'll actually go to a different host thinking that there's a bad route, and they'll try coming from that host, and they get dropped there. Well, now they've revealed two hosts that are probably hacked, and they're trying to get to your system on. 
And at that point, they may rise up and decide to move on, but sometimes they may go to a third house to try there too. And then usually by then they get the clue. Um, that's kind of a nice thing to have. Um, and when you're in warfare, especially if you read like The Art of War by Sun Tzu, um, surprise is a very big factor in winning any battle. You look back through history, surprise has really been a key, a key factor. Um, here, they're really not expecting anything to happen. They're expecting to get a banner back. Well, you know, don't give them a banner. Um, the third one here is it doesn't play games with people. Um, th this is mainly referring to the concept of like a honeypot, where you set up a system and kind of find out what they're trying to do. It, it has its application. I think for most people it doesn't because you're keeping the person around. I want to spot the problem and get rid of them. Make them, you know, go on to the neighbor. I don't want to play with you. I think this is generally a good idea for most people. Sometimes a honeypot can be interesting if you want to see what people are running. Um, most of the time, I, I don't. I think that uh, most of what they're running are what you can download yourself, and it usually isn't a good idea to egg them on. You start playing games with people, and they know it, like they find out, man, this is a honeypot the whole time. I just wasted three hours trying to crack this box. You know, maybe they just decided to download a Smurf program. A 14-year-old kid with a Smurf program can cause a bunch of problems for you. It doesn't take much skill to do that. So usually you just want to get rid of them. Um, theory of operation is pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, it's gonna, the, the first mode bound the TCP ports only. Um, and basically, you, you get a list of ports, it binds to them, it waits for a full connection, and then it drops the host. It's really kind of straightforward. People started writing me and saying, wow, it really would be nice if it did UDP. It really would be nice if it did stealth scans. And then I kept saying, well, if you do that, then someone could forge a scan and then drop your host. But enough people started writing that I figured to um, put the option in, give adequate warning, and let them make up their own mind. And that's kind of still my, uh, my basis today. I've gotten a lot of heat over this, actually. People think that, you know, oh, it's some type of great vulnerability, and I know that. But um, at the same time, I think if people want to weigh the risk, it may not be a tremendous vulnerability for certain hosts. And I think I could provide enough information in the documents that people can make up their own mind of what they want to do. I don't want to make a decision for them. Um, as I said here, TCP is really simple and effective. It binds through a bunch of ports, but it may miss some scans, such as a port scan. When I originally released the tool, I actually mentioned the fact that a port scan I didn't think was a big deal, uh, a stealth port scan I didn't think was a big deal. And the reason for this is because, from my experience, a lot of stealth port scanning is a precursor to an actual attack. And when people are coming in doing a stealth port scan, they're usually collecting data on a wide variety of hosts, and then they're going to come back later and kind of find out whether or not um, that host is going to cough up any information. So in this case here, they're going to get a bunch of ports that are going to come back, and then when they eventually come back and try an attack maybe by hand or maybe by some other automated script, at that point they're probably going to get dropped. And that might be a little bit worse. Yes? Um, UDP is a, is a uh, basically it's, uh, I'm trying to think of a, uh, it, well, it's a, it's a connectionless protocol, but it's completely unauthenticated. Um, it's connectionless meaning that I can send, I can send a packet to the host. It doesn't attempt a, a handshake of any type. So at that point, I can make the packet to be whatever I want, and the host is just going to accept it. And it really has no way of verifying it's coming from the host. Versus TCP, you actually have a three-way handshake that's going to happen with the full sequence knowledge to protect the whole session as it's occurring. And yes, while in the past it has been possible to forge this with modern current is extremely difficult to do. Um, the raw socket binding mode basically works. This is a stealth scan detection mode. It only works on a Linux right now. Um, this is first for the first cut is for expediency. I have to admit, um, Linux has this feature where I can open a raw socket and just start reading packets in off the wire. I don't need to set anything in promiscuous mode. I don't need libpcap or any other libraries on top of that. It is more complex, but it does catch most scans. It certainly catches most of the nmap scans. Um, but it does have a higher false alarm possibility. In fact, the um, latest version of NMAP, they put in a feature called a, a decoy feature. And I'm not sure what caused this to be put in, although I highly suspect it was the release of this tool. Um, but basically, a decoy feature, you give it some decoy, some decoy hose, and as it's scanning you, it also hits you with these fake hose. And it tends to trip sentry to block all these hosts at the same time. It's kind of, I haven't, I haven't had any complaints of people using that directed towards me. If you've been hit by it, I'd love to hear about it, but I haven't heard one person yet. Um, it's not on other platforms yet because it's going to require a lot more code, a lot more investigation, um, and certainly it's going to be a lot more complicated. As I said, I think it's going to use more CPU power on the other systems. I'll probably have to do promiscuous mode or some type of kernel level interface. And it's just going to require a lot more time, which I don't have right now if I want to get these other tools done too. 
Um, now, black toast in three ways, dropping the route, TCB wrappers, or with packet filters. Packet filters are your best bet. They're designed for the task, um, and they work really well. All the modern Unix kernels out there have some type of packet filtering capability built in. You should really use that. TCP wrappers work, but they don't protect all services. If you have HTTP, for instance, and it's not, wrapped against, it's not linked against LibWrap, you're not going to get any protection from uh, TCP wrap, wrappers and other services like that, too. Top one here, change the default route. Um, the, the default route is 333-444-555-666. That's not a valid IPv4 address. Um, so you need to change that. Some people in news groups are saying just leave it alone. That's incorrect. You want to change that. The problem with dropping a route is that you cause something called an asynchronous route, meaning the packets come in, but they don't go out. And that sounds like an advertising slogan. Um, but basically, um, what this means for TCP, it's okay, because that way the handshake doesn't complete. The first SYN packet comes in, but the SYN act doesn't go back out and get to the host. UDP, this is not okay. If they're trying to port scan your host, or they have a particular service they want to attack, you can do blind spoofing with UDP. You don't need to get the packets back. If you already know how the protocol is going to behave, you can still abuse it. So this is really not the optimal way to do this. It does work, but it's just warning you that it's not optimal. If they're attacking a UDP-based service, um, they can do it blind and not have any real issues. Well, if they're, yes, if they're, doing a, if they're doing a port scan, they're expecting an ICMP port, uh, ICMP port reachable or some other indicator. But let's say that they do a port scan, they don't get anything back, but they decide to run their UDP attack script anyway. And the, and the UDP attack script doesn't really care if it gets anything back, it just wants to do a blind spoof. And if it's doing a blind spoof, then you're going to get hammered. This dropping the route is not going to help you there. It's an asynchronous route. The packets still do hit your kernel, they're just not making it back out, so you need to be really careful. Deployment steps are pretty simple. Compile, configure, start one of the options for TCP and one of the options for UDP if you want to do that. Um, the only one I endorse, and I say this multiple times in the doc, is dash TCP. This does a bind to all the ports. It requires a full connect for it to detect a port scan. This is going to be very hard for something to spoof against. Um, that's the only one I endorse. If you want to do the other ones, you need to weigh the risks. Most of the time, the risks probably won't affect you. Um, but if you're running a, a high visibility server or you like egging people on, it's probably going to bite you sooner or later. Um, and then you, you automate it in your init scripts, and then you kind of leave it alone. And that's another premise of my tools. I like to have them be simple to set up, and you kind of leave them alone. And at that point, you just don't need to touch them anymore. You just kind of let them do their job. Um, here's some examples here. Um, someone's coming in. Example.com, they hit port 143. Um, here, port sentry just tells you, okay, I'm going I'm to put them in TCP wrappers with that. I'm going to block them. And then it's going to drop them here using a uh, packet filtering command. At that point, later on, you're going to see here, here's what happened. They started in 1906, and then they went down here, and they just kept trying. And, you know, sometimes people will sit there for hours. Um, and it's probably your scripts aren't timing out correctly. In fact, I'm sure that there's one out there I, I know of. I don't want to say it because I don't want the bug fix. Um, it doesn't time out. It'll just keep sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And also, too, it'll come back days later and try to connect again. So I leave them in there for a while. I call it the penalty box. Um, so they'll sit in there for a while, and they will come back, actually, and retry again. And like I said, sometimes they'll come from multiple hosts. And this is really advantageous, because now they're exposing themselves on multiple sides. And sometimes those hosts may be one you control. It's kind of nice to know that. Um, dangers, again, I hit on denial of service. If someone is forging stealth, um, uh, forging packets, they can cause a stealth in UDP mode to activate. It's not hard to do. Um, a second point here is over-reliance. Um, sometimes you figure you have these tools installed. Well, I'll just wait a bit before I update. Don't do that. It's not a substitute. It's, it's supposed to augment security. It doesn't replace basic administrative tasks. And lastly, it may be an unnecessary application. If you have a firewall that's already secure, don't run another app on it if you don't have to, even if it is a security app. Um, like I said, there is a possibility. I could have screwed up somewhere. There could be some type of remote attack available. You know, um, you just don't want to expose yourself in that way. If your host doesn't absolutely need it, you may not just say, well, you know, I don't care if they port scan me. Yeah, I have a firewall. I, I don't run it on it. I, I just say, okay, port scan me. I, I don't care. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes that's the choice. Sometimes it's not. You're going to have to weigh it on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. 
Um, host Sentry is something released, um, not definitely not as popular as that Port Sentry tool is. It does something called login anomaly detection. And what login anomaly detection does is basically um, it, it's going to watch user login activity. And this came out of a situation about three or four years ago. I was helping out with security in ISP. And one morning, one of the admins noticed a very high CPU on a uh, host out on the West Coast. And um, at this point, he logged in and found out that uh, basically we had a sniffer and crack running on at the same time. Um, so we went in there to figure out what was going on. And basically what happened is a user had their password sniffed. It happens all the time. Um, in fact, it's really quite pathetic. A colleague of mine um, went on a, a rant before about the fact that you know when protocols are pre presented as a form of an RFC, they really need to go through a security audit. If they can't pass it, they really shouldn't be approved. There's no reason why some of the more modern protocols calls like pop and IMAP, pass unencrypted passwords over the wire. It's kind of ridiculous. In this case, this user had his password sniffed by using pop coming out of a university that had people all over it. And um, the person logged in from a European country and kind of went to town on the server. Um, this is very common. Some of you may have had the exact same thing happen to you. It's very hard to defend against. If this person hadn't fired up a sniffer and a, and a crack program, we may not have spotted them just because they were logging in as a normal user. Um, so it's important, I think, to watch some of this. It is kind of Big Brother-esque, but um, sometimes um, you need that for a sysadmin if you want to maintain security. Um, what Host Sentry does is it basically monitors the WTEMP and UTEMP, or similar auditing data format. Right now, though, this is alpha grade software. It's only monitoring the, the WTEMP UTEMP files. And it's made, it maintains two databases. One is a TTY state database. And this, is, this keeps track of the current logins and logouts occurring on the host. And uh, this is for a variety of reasons. One is so Log Sentry knows who's logging and logging out, of course. Um, the other is to help track it between reboots and whatnot to make sure that its own internal records are being cleaned up correctly. The second one is a user database. And a user database, as soon as you log in, you're immediately going to get a user record. That user record is going to have your username. It's going to have when you were created. It's going to have your first login, which included not only the time you logged in, but where you logged in from and what TTY. And it's also going to have a large field called track logins. And what this does is so it keeps track of all your logins, including where you logged in from again, your TTY, your login, and your logout times. It's also going to have whether or not you're allowed to log in at that hour, whether or not you're allowed to log in at that day, whether or not your account's been disabled by the admin, or it's been disabled by the host sentry program itself. And as you're logging in and logging out, host sentry looks at this information, and it runs modular signatures as required. Now, there's several indicators that host sentry actually attempts to spot. The one with the asterisks are not fully implemented yet. Again, this is experimental development software. Basically, are our login and logouts. Not too high tech, except that, again, across Unix platforms, the way these are logged is not consistent. Sometimes if you're trying to track this stuff, it could be a real big pain. Second one, odd, lo odd login times. After you've logged in a certain number of times, the tool ha uh, has the ability to look at your past login and develop a profile of what's going on. In this case, for this signature, it's um, it will look at your past logins and develop like an average time window. So if you don't, if you only log in between eight and five, there's no reason you should be logging in at two a.m. So that's what it's going to look for. First time logins. That's a really big deal. I know it sounds kind of silly. If you run a if you run a Unix host and people don't need a shell account or shell access, please don't give it to them because once the shell access is the biggest security problem with Unix by far. The fact that it allows you that interactive access. Um, for a first time login, if you have a person who's only doing pop, and that's all they need to do, you know, Susie's secretary, Johnny accountant, whoever it is, and then you see that they log in for the first time, and they don't even know how to type, let alone know how to uh, use Unix, you really need to look into that because it's a very suspicious activity. Four domains are put in quotes. Um, basically, this is a domain that you don't control. So if you're running you know, example.com and someone's coming in from hackser.com, you probably want to find out why they are. At the same time, you know, if you're a domain in Germany and someone's logging in from Malaysia, again, another very suspicious activity you need to look for. Unusual username inserted um, is another one, too. This is kind of a, a strange one where basically I know what usernames are supposed to be in the password list. And if another one person logs in with a username I'm not familiar with, I flag it as an attack. And the reason for this, a recent exploit, like I think it was a, a stat D overflow, a lot of them insert uh, a line at the bottom of the password file, like root or hacked or whatever. And at this point, 
they will tell that in as a null password on it or some password they already know about. So they log in and they drop into a shell and they have root access immediately. Well, with this type of signature in there, when they log in, Host Sentry will look them up and say, they're not in the user database I'm familiar with. I'm going to boot them off the system. So that's another way to maybe do a little bit of CYA. Strange file modifications, plus plus an R host or other oddball things, you'd be able to look for with it too. Strange directories, when they log out, Host Sentry will look through their directory. You have dot, 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 space. You have other oddball names that people use to hide things in. Um, things to look for. History file tampering, when you're logging out, it's going to make sure your history file's there. It's going to look you up in the password list. It's going to check what shell you have. It knows what history files go with what shell. It's going to see if that history file is truncated, deleted, or linked to dead null. All very suspicious activities. Multiple concurrent logins is probably not what you think. Um, basically, if someone's logged in, they have five X terms open from a single host. Not a big deal. But if that same person's logged in from uh, five times, and they're logged in from Sweden, Malaysia, China, Jamaica, and Haiti, you know, you really need to look at that because they're probably not in all those places at the same time. It's very, very suspicious activity. Um, invalid UTEMP entry, when you log out, um, Host Sentry will look through and see if you have a matching UTEMP login record. Maybe you've been zapped out. Um, suspicious history commands. Um, running network daemon. Maybe egg drop running when you logged out. Yeah, a lot of you probably want to know that. I don't like that program running on systems I control. Um, um, but I think that's suspicious activity too. If your policy prevents network daemons that users are from running, some people do allow it. A uh, file exists, you, should, you can put in a name of a file you want to look for. If it's in their directory, it'll flag you. Inactive account used. If an account, a lot of times people will create accounts like a corporation, and maybe they get logged into once just to test, right? But then they're not used again. But they have to stay there for various policy reasons or maybe email access or whatever. Well, if that account is used for a login six months later, you should know about that. So um, a feature to be put in host century. And again, the ones with the asterisks, I apologize, aren't done yet. They will be soon. Um, it will flag that. It will say, you know, this is an inactive account. It's suddenly become active again. Maybe you want to look at this. Um, some examples here, sorry for the verbosity. Um, the security alert, here I am, I'm logging in. Here's my TTY, here's some host. And here it goes, first time login, I didn't have a database entry, it's going to tell you about that. And here it's going to go through the action, the action processor tells you who's requesting the action. And then here the foreign domain says, oh, foreign domain user crawling from some host, or some host.com as the case may be. Um, at that point, it will then go through and do what it needs. And here you go, I have a log out, and just saying that I'm logging out. I come back, I log in again. Let's say I modified the foreign domain to say allow some host to come in. Well, next time I log in, it just log in and log out. It's pretty basic. No signatures fired. Let's say you have a test user. Test user logged in here. Nothing really happened. Everything was kosher. And then they log out. Well, now look here. Well, in our host, they dropped a plus plus in. So it takes an action against that. Um, Further, furthermore, they have an odd door name here. They have what? Dot, dot, dot. Um, not a good directory to have in your uh, user space unless they really like having confusing directory names. Um, if someone's name and directory like that, pretty suspicious, I think. Um, uh, further down here, you have a model, uh, history truncated. And it says here that's a symbolic link to bash history. Um, again, not a good thing. If someone's linking to dev, uh, if someone's linking to dev null, they're hiding their activity. Um, a lot of history files only write their data for the current session after they log out. So if you just remove a file, like a lot of people think they're, you know, they're slick. They, they remove a file, they think their history is clean, and they log out. But then the shell, the last thing the shell does is it writes out the history file. You know, so they think that they, they've got away, but they really haven't. Um, so the smarter time, the smarter people generally try to link it to dev null. So when it writes out, it just goes to dev null. Um, one thing someone does that's kind of interesting our history files for their users. I forgot his name. I'm sorry, but he does a. Uh, append only mode on all his users' history files using the, uh, using the secure level flags, and that could be something useful for you. <laughs> the database record here, I'm going to dump the database here, and, and here's what's in the user database. Created the first time login. Here are my logins. I only have two, but you can see what's going on. These stamps here, these stamps here are Unix Epoch. Your login days and hours uh, aren't implemented yet. The, whether it's disabled, these are just flags and the total number of logins. Um, this database will track all the users on your system. And eventually, I'm going to have tools written up that can actually crawl through this entire thing and design pretty little web pages so you can actually track all this stuff and uh, what users are doing when and where. 
Um, again, dangers. Uh, WTemp and UTemp, again, getting back to Unix, they're really not, I mean, they, they've been around for decades, but they're really just not very good. Um, there's a possibility people can tamper with it. I'm assuming that root is not compromised on the host when these tools are running. It's obvious that if root is compromised, that people can really do whatever they want to anything, including my own tools. Um, so it's possible that they could um, somehow tamper with the, uh, the ability to write out that they're even logging in or I may miss it. Um, additionally, if it's a service that's allowing a login but it doesn't write to UTEMP or WTEMP, I may miss that too. Um, so that's another possibility. The UTEMP records are all different for BSD, Linux, and Solaris. Linux and Solaris are okay because their host, host record size is large enough. It's 255 bytes. That means if your host name is 255 bytes or below, I'm going to see the entire thing. Linux goes a step further because it also includes the IP address. And really, any auditing record, you always need to include the IP address because DNS entries are so easy to screw around with that they really can't be trusted. Um, the problem with BSD is the UT host size in the, in the UTEMP struct is either 16 or 32 bytes long. So if you come in from a host named really, 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 really long hosting.com, it's going to truncate it down to 16 or 32 bytes, and uh, the records themselves may not be as complete as you'd like. Um, in the case of host entry, since I'm relying on that information to be there to make certain comparisons with the foreign domains and whatnot, you make it an accurate results back. Again, won't help if we just compromise. And the last thing is, uh, I consider like a last line of defense. It doesn't. It does not replace good security measures, such as protecting your passwords. If you're using services like Pop and IMAP, you just need to make sure you take other measure, measures too that are a little bit more robust. Um, closing thoughts are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm real big on paying attention to your systems. They're almost always going to tell you when there's a problem. I can't under I, I can't exaggerate that enough. Um, uh, you need to be aware of other activity on your network too, such as increased network traffic at certain hours of the days. Um, maybe network devices that aren't functioning as they should. Maybe a password all of a sudden doesn't work the way it used to and nobody on your team has changed it. All these things are just little subtle indicators there's a problem. The last thing using bug track and other security uh, forums is a very great way to stay informed of the latest problems. And Q&A links, I put two there. One is for uh, my webpage, has the papers and uh, tools there. The other one is a security focus, a new website. They had a lot of free tools and security papers, really well organized. Um, I would put up, um, I know I put up Packet Storm security, but uh, there's a certain individual on the net who uh, likes causing problems for people, and I'm not sure the state of the site right now. Um, it's unfortunate, it's a very nice site. Um, questions? Comments? Yes. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I have uh, presentations I do. I always put them up on the web. Um, this will be up on the web when I get back. How much time do you devote to my thoughts and so on? It's great if you can keep up on everything if that's all you're doing, but you definitely have to do other things. And you can't spend too much time. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I like to make tools that kind of can last for a long time between updates for that reason. It does, it takes a lot of work to write software. It's all in my spare time. Um, I try to do at least a few hours a week. Sometimes I'll do four to eight hours a day if I can, but of, of late, it's actually been less than a couple hours a week, and that's just for a variety of circumstances related to work, um, my real work. <laughs> Well, ideally, they hit the first port. Like, what I'll do with if you're doing the basic TCP binding, I always have it bind like a few of the low ports first. If they're doing like a sequential scan, they hit those first, and by the time they get up to you know a higher port, they've already been dropped. If you're on a, like a fast Ethernet with NMAP, um, it may be able to hit quite a few ports before they get dropped because the machine's not reacting fast enough and it just sprayed a bunch of packets. But if they're coming in over the internet where the links are a lot slower, they may hit one port and then um, one, maybe two ports, and then by that time they're dropped and you just kind of vanish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Yeah. 
Well, if, if someone is forging packets to complete their port scan, or, or, are, you, are you asking, are they forging packets to cause a denial of service? Yeah, that's, that's a possibility. I mean, that's just, um, it's something you need to deal with if you're doing stealth scan detection. And again, it depends how, how high profile of a target are you, how sophisticated an attack are you expecting to come in. This is assuming, too, that they actually know you're running the tool. Um, you know, you never want to really go out and tell everyone what your internal security measures are. I mean, sometimes, as much as people like to rag on security through obscurity, it actually really does have its place. So if they know you're running the tool, which I think is very foolish for you to go out and tell people what your internal security measures are again, yeah, they could do that. But are they? Because what's, what's the purpose of their attack? Are they trying to gain access to your host? Or are they trying to let you know with the screaming red banner that you, someone's screwing around with you? So you need to ask that question. If, if someone's playing games with you and you run the dash TCP mode, which requires a full connect, it won't matter because they're not going to get any data back that's going to cause the uh, port scan detection um, to fire. Um, they're just going to get back, oh, maybe it's an open port. They're going to have to go back and do a full um, TCP connect to it, and then they're going to get shut out at that point if they're interested in looking at that port. Yes? Typically, if, if you know if they're trying, well, there, there are variations. I notice now that you know there've been port scan detectors written before that require several ports hidden at once. But I notice there's this, uh, a, a change in the trend. Like a new exploit comes out, you know, IMAP. They're not going to scan my entire box. They're going to IMAP. You know, IMAP in this house. IMAP in this house. IMAP in this house. IMAP in this house. So sometimes. You need to just activate on that one port. So sometimes it may not hit a series of ports. You need to be ready to respond like the one actual attack. Anyone? Yes. Like I said, I've seen scripts before that um, you need to be on the subnet where you think the sniffer is, and the scripts will again try to connect to some host and then see whether or not another host in that immediate subnet has done a DNS lookup on that IP. And at that point, you can maybe pinpoint what it is. But if the sniffer is not doing resolving on the IP addresses, which a lot of the newer ones don't do, then you may not catch it. And there was, like I said, there were some other tools that I think the SNI people were playing with that would uh, do timing, check the timing against it. The, 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 really, the only thing you could do is go to each host, and you could check for promiscuous is on, but then they can hack that so it looks like it's off if they've root-kitted your if config. Um, but there are other utilities available that you can compile um, you know, on, a, on a secure box and bring onto that system and run them, and they can look at the network card directly and uh, maybe tell you whether or not that thing's in promiscuous. Mode. Another indicator, too, is just a very high CPU utilization and an odd process name. Again, they could have went in, you could the PS command or anything else, but if you bring in a secure set of tools, you can sometimes spot it that way. High CPU is a pretty good indicator. Yeah. Did, did the loft release your tool yet? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I haven't I haven't seen it yet. I really am interested in looking at it. It sounds really neat. The, the, the loft the loft is releasing a tool called I think anti sniff, which may be able to help some of what you're talking about. I'm sorry I don't have more information. I've uh, I like to look at it myself. It sounds very useful. Uh, which <laughs> I think CERT had one. Um, CERT had a one or two at their website that can detect promiscuous mode. Um, of course, you can use if config on the box. That'll tell you if it's promiscuous. But again, if they've gone in there and changed that, or if they've done something, some kind of uh, uh, loadable kernel module or something, obscure that fact, you might have a real problem. Yes. Yeah, but that, 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 gets, that gets in a religious war. Um. <laughs> it, 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I mean, if, if someone puts up a, a promiscuous mode card that has no addresses you know, or network protocols bound to it, it could probably be a real problem. But yeah. Anyone else?